Today we have Dwayne Logan, who is an award-winning director, a husband, father of two of the cutest little gals we've ever met, and one of the kindest, most genuine guys out there. We talk about his time as one of the most sought-after assistant directors, his transition into directing, his previous life as a coach for USA Gymnastics, and growing up with five siblings in inner-city Chicago. All right, today we have Dwayne Logan with us, and Dwayne is both a dear friend and incredibly talented uh, director and AD in the entertainment industry. Kate has had the pleasure of meeting him as well and working with him on random sets, (laughs) and we also got to see his entire family at my wedding. So we're so excited to have you here and to hear about... um, the 10 lives you've lived in your (laughs) short time on this earth already. (laughs) So many of them. So many. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited about this. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if you want to kind of give a little idea of what your role is currently, and then typically we'll kind of talk about um, just kind of your life that led up to it, what your childhood looked like and your relationship with your family and, and all of that. But before we get into the background, let's just start with... Uh, what you do now. Gotcha. So I'm currently full-time directing um, and straddling between a couple of buckets. And so I do uh, direct in the commercial space, which is its own animal. Um, My true passion, I just, I'm in love with a good short film. And I know the, thankfully now the market for that is coming around. I think the last couple of Oscars, we had some shorts that that popped up and got some attention that, that gave me a good reason to tell some people I told you so because they're like, there's no such <laughs> thing as a world for shorts. Like, I love it. People love a good short. That's right. Um, and the, if you could see, I'm not sure what the, how wide the cameras are going to be, but I've got two dry erase boards in this office and there's a feature layout on that one and there's a feature film layout on this one. And so the, I've got the three buckets that, uh, I'm, I'm playing in for now or the feature length one. That'll be uh, a debut here, hopefully soon, as I continue to, to write and chip away at that. And so that'll, uh, I've never really had a foray into that world as an AD or as uh, a director. So that'll be brand new fun territory. Uh, shorts have had some success with one so far that just really surprisingly went out into the world. And it just, it's the, it's the little engine that could. It just keeps on chugging. Every day that I turn around, I get some some lovely feedback like, oh, that short your short film's over here and it's over here and it's over here. And uh, on the commercial side, um, it's been, man, what a whirlwind. It it came on pretty fast and, and furiously. And then partially thanks to Ms. Jin putting in a good word for me with the, the lovely guys over at Evolve because I had not... I was very, very quiet as an AD about whether or not I would ever direct. I had a few people say, man, be careful when you say something because the directors that you work with might all of a sudden start to feel a little threatened if they know you want to direct as well. And I think in hindsight, most of the people that I work with are so lovely. They've all cheered me on. They're just like, Dwayne, absolutely. Please don't ever AD again. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was very guarded about that. And so I didn't say much. But the, um, the guys over at Evolve kind of helped me crack that egg. And then it was kind of off to the races. I've gotten uh, such a lovely opportunity to direct for some brands and clients that I would have, I mean, bucket list. So I've, I've got Nike on the reel. I've got Jeep on the reel. I've got Disney on the reel. I've got um, God Almighty. The, we've got Catherine Zeta-Jones in there. We've got... Uh, all just all of these fantastic stars, Derek Luke, and um, and it's just it's building by the second. NBA athletes, former Olympians, and uh, so, you really yeah, didn't have to schlep it in that world, <laughs> like most people. <laughs> most people do, and you definitely seemed to bypass a lot of the a, a lot of that because I remember the first spot you directed being like, oh, casual, sure, and then the next time I talked to you, yeah. I think you were on like. Yeah, it was a it was a vehicle shoot. I feel like in LA, and I was like, "Oh, sure." 
Because a lot of that yeah. stuff, um, I mean, I've just, I've worked with directors long enough to know that agencies can be so particular about if you haven't done exactly the type of vehicle that we want to shoot, we don't know if we can trust you with this. And it did. It seemed yeah. like that. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm guessing the opportunity with Evolve really opened those doors for you pretty quickly. It really did. And it's, um, you know, I, I certainly don't take that for granted because you know, it's a lot of those clients, people are shooting spec spots to try to get the attention of clients like that. And I jumped right in as a very new director. And I don't know if maybe my history as an AD helped that much. I'd like to think that it, it certainly helps me when I'm on set, but I don't know if that helped sell me for an opportunity, but you're spot on. So much of the commercial world is if we can't see the exact thing that we're looking for on your reel, what you're capable of means very, very little. It's all about, we want to know that you bake the exact cake with the exact sprinkles and the exact color frosting. Like this is no exaggeration, Kate. Like I've literally been on client calls and they're like, well, has this director shot green juice before? And you're like, oh my God, like, (laughs) what do you mean? Purple juice. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's kind of wild, but I guess going back just a little bit, um, when you say AD, explain what an AD does versus what a director does. Yeah. And so the, man, the, the job of an AD, it's, it's such a uh, widely misunderstood role, I think, even by ADs, which uh, I've painfully come to realize once I've stepped into the director's seat, it's like, <laughs> oh God, like, what, what are you doing? Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, I think the, the way I would best describe it, an AD is someone that is really mindful of all of the producer's goals is to get the shoot accomplished on time, on budget, safely. But they're also uh, very in tune with the, d- the director's goals, which is to bring forth this really awesome and fun creative vision and to make sure that they have all the things that they need to be able to do that well. And then you also have to be really mindful of what's happening from a client side. What does the client want? What are the client's needs? And sometimes all three of those things contradict each other. The yeah. client wants something that the producer doesn't want. The producer wants something the director doesn't want. The director wants something the client doesn't want. And there you are in the middle mm-hmm. facilitating these these wheels of power because all of those people at the end of the day have to achieve their their goal. And so I think the, the AD is really the, the kind of the, the grease between that, that gigantic wheel. And if you do your job really well, no one gets hurt. We stay on budget. We stay on time. The director doesn't feel stressed when they're, they're doing their thing. The client and the agency feels like they have a voice uh, that showed up in the creative without a lot of stress. And the, the producer gets to hopefully in that job with such a, um, a kind of a, a send off to where they get another shot at it with that same client. And so that's the, the really broad strokes version of it. But then if we, we kind of crack down into it, into a more layered and nuanced uh, sort of a, of a talk, man, each, I, I think, I, I wonder how some ADs do it if they didn't have the opportunity that I had, which was to spend time in every set mm-hmm. or, or every department on set. And so our department, Grip Electric, uh, hair and makeup even, just kind of hanging out in those trailers. And when you truly understand what, what each of those departments need and what they're going through, the way that you can communicate their needs and, and balance all of the, the, the plates, it makes such a difference. Um, I think most ADs feel like human watches. You just walk around and they just tell you how much time there is for things. And it's so unfortunate when that's what you get out of an AD. It's like, well, We've got five minutes, guys. We've got five minutes, guys. And you're not thinking at all about who has to do what in those five minutes, how stressful it's going to be for those in those five minutes, if it's even possible in those five minutes. In the the tunnel vision of we've just got to make the day, it, it makes for a really stressful situation. Yeah. And I think um, like what that can also culminate in into is when you talk about like if it's even possible there are a lot of times that, especially when you get to the level and there are levels that you've both directed and AD at, you're dealing with also celebrity talent. You're dealing with um, 
managers, which sometimes are more difficult than the actual talent you're dealing. I mean, you're dealing with <laughs> yeah. uh, press people. Like it can get really hairy really fast. And I think um, you ad the Cheetos spot with yeah. Jeff Inable, right? Yeah. So we we had a shoot, Kate. Um, this was, gosh, around, it was around one of the Olympics, I feel like, because it was the curling team. And mm-hmm. we had on that, um, we had a dancer, a celebrity dancer. We had NFL players. Mm-hmm. We had the Olympic curling team. And we were on ice. So we were oh, literally nice. like at a, at a skating <laughs> rink on ice with these like incredibly expensive cameras and lenses and cranes and people that had to wear crampons on their shoes so they wouldn't fall and people who refused to wear them. And it was yes. just um, kind of like, it's, it's, it's insanity is what it mm. is. And people are spending so much money for that one day that you also have that layer of just like intense pressure on someone like a Dwayne. Um, which is why Dwayne was always our first call when we had shoots like that. Because we, mm-hmm. again, like we said, it's like you have all these difficult things going on and you really need somebody who can come in and not um, make an impossible situation also miserable. Mm-hmm. Because I think a lot of the ADs that I met when I first started, they AD'd by force. It was like intimidation, yelling, um, kind of to the point where you're like, are you not worried you're going to get fired? But that was just kind of like the <laughs> expectation of like how they operated. It was, mm-hmm. it was definitely like almost like old school parenting or something. I don't know. Like you're going to get spanked if you didn't move fast enough. <laughs> yes. So Dwayne was like the, uh, the very opposite of that. The gentle parent. Mm-hmm. I love yes. it. Gentle, gentle parent. parent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I feel like I carried a, a lot of, um, experience from coaching over into ADing. So the previous life before the other previous lives, <laughs> I was a, a full-time gymnastics coach for USA Gymnastics and, and private clubs. And um, there's, I've never met an athlete uh, or a child or a human for that matter, who is positively motivated by force. I just, I've never met one, not one. Uh, at least not in a healthy way. And whenever you do meet a a child that's used to that, especially if that's what's coming from home, you realize that you get really short-term positivity out of them, but it's not lasting. You can't, you can't build a career out of that. And so you've got to, I think the, there's nothing more empowering for, for anyone than to, to know that they're understood. And I think that's where we kind of go back to that time that I had, uh, to spend in each department when you can go to a department head and speak to them and speak their language. And they know that, you know, it's like, Hey, I've got an Ikea desk. That's going to take 55 hours to put together. And they want it in five minutes, Dwayne. And when you can talk to them and say, Hey, I get it. I, I looked over there and it's in another language. And how about this? How about I go back to them and we can move on to this set. We can try this setup. We can buy you a little bit more time and then we can come back around here. And when you see the stress leave their face and then you could go to the director and say, hey, how about this? How about I'm not going to tell you what to do, but if we've got a bunch of cards in our hands and if we were going to play that, we were going to play this one. How about we just lay this one down for a second? We play this one. We actually will steal five minutes from this to put 10 minutes over here. And it, it's it's all a game of, of chess, really. And the director actually feels like, oh, yes, I actually would like five more minutes over there on that little shiny thing that I'm going to obsess over anyway that you're already <laughs> going to take five more minutes on. And you know, it's it's that's the, the name of the game. You've got to be able to, to relate to people um, and get close to them and make sure that it's never like Jen was saying across the room where you're, you're chanting, like yelling commands at people. Get close, whisper in an ear. Uh, Tony Reyes, he's this fantastic steady cam operator, uh, out of Nashville. He put me on blast on social media once with this, uh, I think John Chima took a photo of me getting close to the camera department and they call it, called it like the Dwayne Lurk or something like that, where I just kind of slowly, like kind of creep up behind the department and they know that like, sometimes it's me just standing. Yeah, here he comes. And sometimes it's just me standing there. So that all the powerful people see that the AD is like moving things. And really what it turns into is like, how's the back? How's the back doing? 
You doing all right? Do you need a break? Do you need water? They see us over here talking so they can chill out and they can stop stressing for a bit. But are you okay? Are you good? Great. And then you go over to a, to the next guy and it's that kind of thing. And really what people just want to know is that it feels like the train is moving. Uh, I, I've met very few people on set that are genuinely lazy and don't want to work hard. Most people do. They just need the, the time and space to do it and somebody that understands that. Yeah. And the producer typically says there's not enough money for extra time and that's my job. So I totally appreciate <laughs> when it seems like the train's moving, even if it's still, you know, in the same spot. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I think all of that experience, of course, would make you um, a stronger director. I think even just, I've worked with directors who maybe they haven't worked in every department, but they've worked in a couple of the departments and that's so helpful because um, it's just like mm -hmm. truly understanding your team and what they're doing and why things take a certain amount of time um, can make the difference and just being really strategic with the time you have on set. So I'm sure that has helped you tremendously. It would be interesting to know if that's helped you with like client. Um, yeah. Like getting selected. Um, Cause I wonder how much clients truly understand what the AD does. Um, you save the day. That's what they know, <laughs> but <laughs> they don't really right. know how it's magic. <laughs> yeah, I'm still trying to figure out how to work that in. I think there's there's a potential uh, shot in the foot that can happen where it's like, oh, well, if you you mention anything about being an AD, then now we, we stop seeing you as this this director who can do what we need. Yeah. And then there are others that are just like, oh, yes, like we're not going to go over budget on this thing. And he understands not just the creative, but the logistics that we're up against, which nowadays just matters so much because the budgets just keep going down. Yeah. Um, and the constraints just keep getting tighter. And if you understand how to, to play in a, in a sandbox well with what you've got, uh, sometimes that can, I think, I feel like it has, uh, come across well. And man, I just think about so many of the, the tough things from ADing that have translated over, which is sometimes when you've got to, you really do, everything can't be a very gentle hug and you're a, a warm and fuzzy human. Some things do have to be a little bit more direct, but man, if you really pick and choose those moments really, really well and people take you seriously. And sometimes it's just a, uh, a change of expression in the face and the, you, they can see it on your face. Like, Hey, this is, we got it. We got to really, <laughs> get this moving here that has translated well um i was on a set recently uh directing and i just it had a bunch of moving parts and all these uh, very intricate elements and all i kept hearing was we gotta go we gotta go we gotta go we gotta go we gotta move on we gotta move on we gotta move on but sometimes you just know you just know this is going to be one of those things where they get in the edit and they say it's not there yeah and you just know that you got to stop the train for a second mm -hmm. and get the thing. And then we can move on. So I love that that's translated over as well. Like the, the ability to say like, Hey guys, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you, but please trust me right now and let me do this thing. And that's a, that's a tough thing to own sometimes, especially in commercial world, because you're on features. It's it, you're more likely at least the, the world that I plan to be in, you're more likely farther up the food chain. You're one of the creators. Commercials, there's a whole ad agency that's yeah. worked for months and months, maybe years on the thing that you're trying to deliver. And so to be able to to do that dance with them and say, hey, can you can you please trust me for a second? And I know that you're not only paying the bills, but it's your client. Your neck is on the line. It's it's a dance. It's a very delicate dance. I'm grateful that I've had a lot of practice with. Yeah. No, it's um, being in the agency now, um, which is a new thing for me, is, is definitely an interesting thing to know the amount of time that goes into the creative before it ever gets sent off to the production company. It's mm -hmm. kind of mind boggling, honestly. <laughs> um, but it's been interesting just to see that side of it because – it really paints the full picture for you. I think, you know, we, we all have like our experiences and that, that is one of the things I loved um, about freelancing. And even when I wasn't freelancing, just uh, in Nashville, there was so many different types of work that you really got to see how everybody did things and then figure out, 
okay, like this works in the music video world, but it also could work in commercial world. Like we could add mm. this little, you know, schedule snap, like how we're going to just adjust things just a little bit or how we're going to scout a job. I just think there's a lot of um, benefits to having that diversity of experience. Oh man. I think it, the, that's such a, an important thing to, to mention about Nashville's market. Um, and I think it's really one of the things that I stand on, like to be in the, the position that I'm in now, the diversity of projects that I had the opportunity to PA on, to second AD on, to AD on, and then to direct that came through Nashville. I just would have, I never would have dreamed it when I first moved there. The, it completely took me by surprise. And, um, I mean, I just, the, the, the scope of it, I mean, as a PA, I think I probably, there were two to three years where I was working on everything from music videos to commercials to PAing on some features. Um, I maybe was working five days out of a week for about two to three years straight. That's a lot and of work. That Especially accumulated actually, experience. Yeah. I don't know a whole lot of markets that, that would allow someone to, to get that kind of experience in that short of amount of time. It's Nashville's incredible. Yeah. Kate snuck her way on a couple of sets as a PA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you PA on a couple? A couple. Yes. Because I was in my, uh, early stay at home mom era. And I was like, please give me something to do. Um, <laughs> but I learned very quickly, um, that maybe I wasn't quite cut out for it. Um, <laughs> I think because I just get so, um, distracted, you know, like I'm just a bit of a, I have a little bit of that squirrel energy, um, or like anything shiny just kind of like pulls me over there. Um, or like if I get really, um, I, I did a job with Jen where we were in this house that had a bunch of cats in it that we didn't know about. Um, Ooh. and they were like, yeah, it was like a, you guys, um, what's it called when you like booked the shoot to be at this woman's house? Uh, like we didn't scout it because the client had, the client had the location. Yeah. Uh, so we just got to show up. Yeah. Nice. But we showed up and the place was like legitimately infested with cats. Like there were cats in the walls and in the vents and they were like, <laughs> it was the most insane thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I can't remember any other part of what I did for that job other than the fact that I was so enamored by the amount of cats that were shoved into this building. So like, I don't know. It, that was, it was wild, Dwayne. Like there, we literally at one point we opened these closets and there were just like racks of crates with cats in them. Literally. Like <laughs> yeah. I would jail. I couldn't even actually wager a guess as to how many cats were in that house, but I would have to say at least 20. I mean, it was oh like, my gosh. yeah, we had to so wrap early bizarre. because the smell of ammonia was so strong. It was so oh. crazy. It was yeah. really, really crazy. I think you yeah. did PA on, um, I think you were on this job only because I remember it being so tragic. It was the, um, yeah. the day that, um, <laughs> the day we, that we, Trump, shared, we shared uh, a few of those. Uh, and no, it was the day that Trump was elected. The, the day and that we Trump all was showed elected. up on set. It was like the, the grocery the, 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 store shoot. It was the, the grocery store shoot. Kate was on that one too. You PA'd on that? I did PA on that, which also, uh, embarrassingly, I think I only didn't get fired from that job because Jen was my sister on it because I, I got a terrible <laughs> migraine like early on in the day and I literally like went and took a nap. So like, don't hire me for anything. <laughs> um, and I don't think I've worked on a job with Jen since then. You know, it's like I just at this point, it's not my strength. So I'll watch people's kids right now. Uh, maybe, you know, if I know them, yeah. like them enough. Um, you, but yeah, you strike me as a you strike me as a human, also that is kind of like when the ridiculousness level gets really, really high as a human. That's just like mm. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. And I'm and I'm more like, how far will this go? I'm like intrigued enough that I stay yeah. around and I end up having to do something disgusting on set. Yeah. Like to yeah. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm going to bow out, but I'm going to keep contact with someone there so that they can tell me about it later. Like, I still want the story. I just don't want the experience. You know, I don't want it. Thank you. Kate's like, did this make my hair fall out? Yeah. I think, I think I'm go. good. Time I think go. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. It was just smart. I think there's a, I always say it like, if you don't have a really phenomenal why for this business, it's just not going to, it's not going to go on for very long. 
Yeah. Like the why's got to be crazy, crazy deep. Yeah. yeah. It'll eat you alive otherwise. Um, <laughs> going yeah. back before, before, okay, so directing now, ADing before, PAing before that. Some point you were gymnastics coach, casual. Um, can you do a back tuck? Could you? I'm, I might be able to still squeeze one out. Like the, <laughs> but, there's this. But you could at one point. That sounded terrible. The, I could, yeah. The, wow. there was a time in the second AD slash first AD era, where if it was a music video, my dread, my nightmare was that somebody was going to say, did you know he used to dance and he can do, oh, like he hmm. used to coach. And before you know it, now I'm choreographing on the spot mm, and I'm tumbling like- on the spot or I'm dancing on camera. There's a whole host of music videos out there where it's like, you could play a very like fun, where's Waldo? Like, where's Dwayne? That's terrible. <laughs> And it's like, there he is. There he's, there's a, I think the, uh, there's this Keith Urban uh, music video where I got forced into to dancing and tumbling on set. And there I am flying upside down and there are little kids running around. It's a, it is, it was inescapable for a while there. And thankfully <laughs> the, the knees in the back are still okay enough to maybe crank one out for the girls. Uh, if my daughters want to see something, but yeah. I'm retiring that. Yeah. Wow. I stopped doing gymnastics um, right before I got my back tuck. What a fool. Um, we can get you. It's never too late. Chill. Oh, it's too late. No, I can't. <laughs> no. no, listen, I was teaching elementary school in Indianapolis and I was only like at that point, 29 years old. So we're a decade past that. And one of the teachers somehow back handsprings camp. And I was like, I can still do back handspring. And she was like, no, you can't. And I was like, yeah, I can. Well, I could do a running back handspring. I hadn't done a standing back handspring in a long time. And when I tell you, I crumpled. (laughs) And I crumpled onto a cheap, it was like cement floor with a thinnest carpet. And it was just like, oh, oh, I mean, it took took a long time for my neck to straighten out. Um, So there are no more, no more backflips for me. I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to let you kill that, that talent, Jen. We're going to, we're going to resurrect it. I mean, Coming the only back. way I could do it is a back tuck because my wrists are too weak now to hold my body up. It's like a back handspring. That's a lot of weight on the wrists. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I need to just go soaring through the air. No hands. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's just have like a day like where we like wrap and we just have like a tumbling clinic just yeah. randomly. What insurance? Probably. What well, actually the producer. I have decent and you insurance probably... right now. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, let's do fun. it yes please yeah that was a uh, another one of the previous lives 14 years of, of that of coaching gymnastics full-time and a lot of those experiences have a lot to do with why i got into into this and how i got into that was was crazy and has a lot to do with it. it's all of these like you said all of these these lifetimes have all kind of uh attached themselves together to, to bring to the bring us to the here and now so let's take it all the way back then, all the way back to um, you as a kid. Where did you grow up? What's your family dynamic? Do you have any siblings? Like, let's kind of get a a look at that. What did your parents do for a living? Um, just to kind of get an idea of how you even got to this one place of seemingly insane amounts of patience, um, but also, <laughs> but also this like wild ability to just be so flexible or like recognize solutions to problems that aren't miserable or not thought out. Like you seem to just have these, this ability to figure it out immediately. Mm. Like what, what, what got you that skill help? Oh man. <laughs> help. <Yeah>. This is very, <laughs> help me. This, this is very sweet of you. Thank you. The, um, I don't know, man. I think the, so like early on, so I'm one of six. Um, I don't think mom, I knew that. Yeah, there's six of us. Mom raised six kids, and all of our names almost rhyme. It's so Chandra and Dana, they're two girls. So the, the two girls were the mini matriarchs of the household. Um, so it went Chandra, Dana, Daniel, Dwayne, Nathaniel, and Leandre at the, the, uh, the tail end. Um, so I'm almost in the middle. The, we grew up inner city Chicago on the south side of Chicago and, uh, Man, if you heard much about the South Side of Chicago, the it is true. It is very true. It's a tough place, man. It's 
it's been a tough place. It's a very underserved uh, side of Chicago. It's, I think it's only gotten worse as the years have gone by. And, um, the, my mom, she was, it's, it's crazy. I, I don't know that I've ever met anyone so talented at so many different things. That's never really like latched on to, to one of those things that she's been really talented at and really been able to, to just funnel all of her energy and time and effort into it. She was a very young mom when she had my, my oldest sister. And I think from that point forward, she just kind of had to shift everything into survival mode. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't much happening uh, in the, the way of, (laughs) Hey, what talent do I have that I want to pursue that I want to chase down? It was just, how do we survive? And, you know, once one, one kid turns into six, you can imagine what that looks like. And um, man, it was, uh, there was this, this period of time where I, I, I remember things kind of stabilized a little bit, but there, there've always been these um, really charismatic men uh, that are, that are all of our fathers that, that came along and seemed like they were going to be around. And then they're just like, I'm going to pick up some milk. Mm. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Not the milk run. <laughs> the milk yeah. run. Oh, Dwayne's man. like, I actually hate milk. Oh my God, you're intolerant. <laughs> no, you take Ex- lactose. See? Exactly. It's I'm always popping lactate. It's in there. It's like part of the DNA. I can't stand milk. Like the, <laughs> I refuse to ever tell my children I'm going out for milk. I won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> got us over and over again. And so they, the, she just, I think she did the best she could with what she could. And, uh, you know, to this day, there's a, there's a gigantic amount of gratitude and appreciation for, uh, for her doing all that she could in such a tough city, um, in such tough circumstances. I mean, there were some nights where, you know, the, you're just doing what you can and the lights are off and the heat is off and the water is off and there's, like what's for dinner? The, I think one of the, uh, the favorites when things got really, really hard was, um, syrup sandwiches. You just get a piece of bread and you grab some syrup out of the pantry and bang, you got dinner. And so it's, it has been a, a journey for, for all six of us. The, uh, I'm really proud of where all six kids have, have ended up. It's been quite a success story. And, we were such a rambunctious group of kids. We had this nickname, Carol's Kids, uh, that, that all of the family and, you know, I, we probably earned it the, <laughs> uh, the, the worst way. Whenever we'd show up to family functions, we were the ones probably tearing things up and, and going a little bit wild. But, uh, now I think the, uh, the sentiment in the family is like, where's Carol's kids? Like, it's just not a family function without, without those kids, you know, they, uh, at my brother's wedding, it was so much fun to stand up and, and tell his wife, like, you're getting one of the best of us. And I was like, hopefully you get a piece of this. And so we started talking on all of this inside Carol's kids language. And so I'd I'd make a sound effect and then the rest the other five would echo the other part of the sound effect. Or I'd quote a, a piece of a line from a movie and the other five would quote the rest of that piece of the line from a movie. And it's like, and hopefully you get a part of of this culture and in this world, because we've been through so much. We've been in street fights together. Like all six of us have literally been in fights with like families on the street uh, together. And so we're just as thick as thieves right now. Um, and I'm so grateful for it. It's tough to be so far away from them being in California right now, but man, oh man, Carol's kids. It's a, it's a, it's a tribe worthy of, I, I would say worthy of knowing and worthy of being loved by and, and accepted by. It's a, a Carol and her her babies. Carol's making me cry over here. No. <laughs> I'm, just thinking, like, I'm just thinking like I just feel like it's such a testament to who your mom must be as a person that like you turned out to be somebody that is like such a joy to be around and such a kind mm. person and like so patient and I can't imagine the amount of patience that she must have had to like pull from every possible source that she could to handle six kids on her own. Like that would be an unimaginable feat to me. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think like, I'm sure that there were so many times where she's a a mom and she's carrying the stress of making sure that her, her kids are okay and that they're having 
a good experience, but you're also kind of growing up in a rough area and like how scared she must have been along the way to make sure that like you guys were good and that she was good and she wasn't losing herself in the, along the way. And I just think that like, Oh, to like see her kids now and like, Mm. know that like, that's the reputation that they have. Like, this is the joy. This is like, if you want to have a good party, these are the people to be here. Like, they're so Mm. great. Like, Oh, just what a testament to like the kind of woman that she that she must be. Like it makes me mm. jealous that I don't know her <laughs> because <laughs> that's like we'll the kind sure. of person to celebrate. You know what I mean? Like, yes. oh my gosh, what a treat! Ugh. Oh man, <laughs> and just like you saying that, really, it's funny. Sometimes you, when you're so close to a thing, you lose appreciation for it. And so I'm so grateful for this moment right now to really think and spend time reflecting on just how incredible of a woman she is and the, you know, it's, um, she spends time saying, Oh, I should have done this and I could have done this and I could have done this. And I think as parents, we, we could spend way too much time doing that. And it's been such a joy telling her, but, but let's talk about the things that you did. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, let's spend some time talking about the things that you got right. Um, and some of the things that she instilled in us. I mean, the, uh, my some of my favorite memories are 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 her in in a kitchen on a Sunday playing all of her gospel music and jamming and with her hands up in the air and like when everything around her looks like it's from see now I'm gonna get emotional oh, no. yeah. <laughs> like if the world feels like it's like collapsing and there she is with her hands in the air and she's thanking God you know it's man you can't. I think those are, if there's anything worthwhile or worthy in me or about me or of me, it's from, from those kinds of moments. Ugh. Did your mom, um, Carol. did your grandparents, oh, Carol. Mm. Good job, girl. <laughs> Carol. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> did your grandparents live close by or was your mom kind of like on her own? Like what? So we, we moved around a lot. Um, and I think one of the, the backstops, one of the, the catches for, for my mom was her mom uh, on the south side of Chicago, inner city. And we spent a ton of time over at my grandmother's house, just an absolute, uh, probably, I mean, a really good chunk of my childhood. My grandfather passed away really early. Um, and so, I mean, and it is funny because as I continue to trace it back, so Edith, my grandmother, I, I don't know that I've met a human quite like her before or since. I mean, she was the, I mean, she's the person that just, God almighty, just gave and gave and gave to her own detriment. Even when you like, when all logic says like cut people off and shut them out and say enough is enough. She just could not and would not stop loving people. And she was like that until the day that she passed away. Um, and so the, being able to spend a ton of time around her as well. I mean, I think I've, I've stolen once in my entire lifetime. <laughs> I was a kid. Uh, I can't remember how old, but we wanted, there was this little candy store on the corner of my grandmother's block and we were so hungry and I just so desperately wanted to be able to get something from that candy store that I went up to my grandmother's room. And I dared open this jar of coins that she had. And I pulled a, pulled, I think it was a nickel out. And the, I stood there with this nickel and I heard some, some footsteps outside of the, uh, the outside in the hallway. And I just dove underneath this bed that was in her room. And I just cried and cried and cried. I was holding this nickel in my hand. I was so <laughs> embarrassed. And I finally came out and I, and I put it back and I went downstairs and she never said, that she saw me or heard me, but I knew that she knew. And it was just one of those moments where like the, her gentleness of just kind of like calling me over and like spending some time with me and putting an arm around me and asking me if I needed anything and finding something in the kitchen for me to eat. You know, it was just like, I've learned so many of the lessons in my life through, through love. And, And it's funny because now like my brain just goes right back to the way that I communicate with people. Like the, People have to be motivated through love and not through through iron fists. And that's really the the kind of discipline that I've gotten now that I mm-hmm. think about it. There's so many aha moments. That's the way Edith communicated with us. 
Mm-hmm. The, I mean, don't get me wrong. We got some spankings. <laughs> God almighty, we got some spankings, <laughs> man, some switches. And who came up with the idea of making uh, irons with detachable cords? Have you ever uh, seen these things? No. You you detach the cord from a from a clothing iron, and it is the worst spanking you can ever oh. dream of of oh. getting. Uh, switches like you, she Edith had this thing, man. She could grab a uh, a plant out of the garden and just kind of take a hand down it and remove <laughs> all of the the leaves. It's like a sheath, and then she yeah. yes. And then she's left with this, this this weapon of discipline. So we certainly got the, some spankings, but man, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it was just let me love on you, let me love you, right? Mm-hmm. Ugh. <sighs> Parenting is so hard, and I think about like all the times where I handle things in a way that I immediately regret or look back on, and I'm like, oh, it's not. Mm that wasn't it, you know? (laughs) And I think Mm -hmm. that like, as parents, that is like the forever, the hardship that we deal with. Like we, I I never feel like I'm doing a good enough job. You know what I mean? I'm always thinking about like, what are they going to have to heal from with me? (laughs) Because, because I know that I'm like, and I think that my husband and I talk about this a lot because we, um, we do this other podcast called broken youth club where we like talk about our childhood trauma and how it has kind of like affected us long-term. And then we talk about how we, you know, know that there are going to be things that we're missing uh, as Mm -hmm. parents and how to kind of uh, tackle that whenever we get older. But like (sighs) hearing that, like, she had those moments of like tough love where you kind of look at now and you think, I'm sure with your kids, you're like, gosh, I can't imagine going out to the garden and pulling anything and spanking my kids with it, you know? But like, but like even in that, that's not what you took from the relationship, right? Like you are looking back at that relationship with her so fondly of like, but when she was loving on me, she loved me so well that like, that's what I'm pulling from. I'm not pulling from, these moments that she probably looked back on too and was like, I hated doing that. You know, like I just didn't know what else Mm. to do. I sometimes as parents, like we're people too, and we get overwhelmed and we just don't handle shit. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. and we feel terrible afterwards. And I think about like times where I'm sure that my parents, you know, said whatever they said to me and then walked in the other room and thought like, man, I really shouldn't have said that, you know, but like, damn, I just, she just caught me. She (laughs) Um, and so there's also just this little bit of like relief in hearing even something like that, where it's like, that's not what you remember about her. And I hope that my kids don't remember the times where I've like yelled too loudly at them, or I've said something that I immediately just like knew I shouldn't have said, you know, like, Oh man, yeah, it's I can, just so hard. <laughs> I can, I can vouch for that so much. I mean, because there were, you know, like we, like was mentioned before, there were a lot of, there were a lot of moments where it was just like, oh man, that wasn't great between us. And there were a lot of moments where as a kid, I, I probably, um, you know, I, I tried to run away from home a couple of times and you're just like, this place sucks. I'm <laughs> out of here, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, but, but now the thing that, that resonates is that, man, love was abundant. Gosh, mm. love was abundant. And I mean, and it just, if you if you asked me to think about the the really hard times, it would actually take me effort mm-hmm. to to recall a lot of that. And again, we man, we just had a it was a tough time. It was a tough childhood. And it was, the inner city Chicago uh, time came to an end after a guy got his head blown off right around the, the corner, and we were nearby it. You know, my mother, she, we were constantly evading trauma and tragedy. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's such a tremendous need uh, for all six of us that there was just no way she could she could fill. She, there's no way that she could know what her old, oldest daughter needed and the second oldest daughter needed and what Daniel needs and what Dwayne needs and really be attentive to all those things simultaneously. It was impossible. But today, the thing that resonates is that love won. And I mean, yeah. my, my, my mom and I, we are just like the best buddies now. It's so mm-hmm. much fun because she... Uh, she went to school for uh, fashion design for a bit, and then she bounced that over to photography for a bit. And then she 
uh, was pursuing art therapy. And there are all these things that she never really still to this day, she's never been able to truly say, OK, now I'm doing that thing. I'm an art therapist. Um, and so she really lives very vicariously through me. Like it's mm -hmm. like, you know, I really like that shot you took. And you know where you get it from. It's like, I know where I get it from. Like, I know it's, it's, it's in the genes. I know I got it from, from mama. And I mean, the, at the end of the day, that's what, that's what I remember. I, I think when we sing her praises, when, whenever that, that very sad, but triumphant day will come, that's, what's going to be abundant. We're not going to remember the stuff that she got wrong. Yeah. Um. So once you kind of, got out of your mom's house and did you go straight into college after high school or what did that kind of look like? I, I did not. So the right out of high school, um, I got recruited by two of the loveliest humans, John and Judy Redmond, who owned a gymnastics club. And I'll back up a little bit. The, when my mom moved us to the suburbs because of that crazy incident, mm -hmm. um, the, the only thing that I knew about gymnastics was through this incredible group called the Jesse White Tumbling Team out of Chicago. And these guys are just a group of inner city acrobats from the worst neighborhoods you could think of. And Jesse White was a politician in Chicago who, I mean, his story is crazy. I'm dying to make something to tell him thank you. Um, but he created this tumbling team to give these kids an outlet. And they were like, God's to us. So inner city Chicago, you had Michael Jordan and the Jesse White tumbling team. And if you, if it was your 15th birthday and you couldn't do 15 back handsprings down the street where you were like the lamest kid on the block, because <laughs> God, like, look at this bum over here. Like he can't even, he can't even tumble. Like you had to be able to tumble to actually exist on these streets. And it was thanks to that tumbling team. And so I always wanted to make the team. I never could because my mom didn't have transportation to get me to the tryouts. But then we, whenever we'd like catch a bus to go and get groceries or something, if you saw this red panel mat on like a parking lot, parking lot pavement, you stop, you get off of the bus because that means that the tumbling team's about to come and you, you get off and you get out there and you hope that they call you and they flip over your head or somebody puts you on the shoulders. But I mean, just, it was it was ingrained in you, this idea of wanting to be able to fly like they could fly. And so when my mom moved us to the suburbs, the there was this day it, where uh, I finally made it to high school for the first time ever I saw a gymnastics set up. And so the, the rings, the pommel horse, the, the P-bars, the, the balance beam, I was like, what is this? And so a couple of my buddies and I were just like bouncing off of the walls in this place. And this uh, this educator, Miss Stelzer, comes in. She was like, "You should try out for the gymnastics team." I was like, "You're not putting me in spandex." <laughs> and she's like, "Oh, we've got a tough guy here. So why don't you um, why don't you show up after school and I'll give you a couple of things to uh, to try. And if you can do them, I'll leave you alone. And if you can't do them, you join the gymnastics team. It's like you got a deal, lady. So I show up. And long story short, she first takes me over to a set of rings and she's like, you've probably seen this skill on TV before. You're going to, I'm going to hold your feet up, put your arms out to the side, like a letter T. I was like, yeah, I know it's called an iron cross. Like, yeah, let's do it. And so she's holding my feet and I've got the arms out and she lets go. And of course I can't hold the position. I dislocate my shoulder and she's looking at me like <laughs> down on the ground. She's like, would you like to try something else? Like, yes, I would. And so she like grabs my shoulder and like works it back in. And then we go over to a set of P-bars and she's like, all right, let's see if you can get into a handstand. It's like, yeah, I, like, I know what a handstand is. So I'm in a handstand. She's like, all right, now I'm just going to let your feet swing down. Just don't fall. And I know she let go, but everything else kind of blacked out. Like I was on the ground looking up at her and she was like, I'll see you for practice. And so that's how I got <laughs> on the, the gymnastics team. And she was so lovely that she not only uh, made me keep my word and show up for gymnastics practice, but she then uh, latched on to me because she was like, I saw what you were doing with your friends and you weren't just tumbling. You were coaching them. You're like, hey, like watch this and maybe do it like this. She's like, I think you have something. It's like, ah, oh, whatever. 
But she allowed me to leave like social studies class and math class to come down to the PE unit in gymnastics and help her teach, teach those classes. And so I was still getting my class credit in high school while I was doing these really cool classes. And long story short, I just fell in love with it. Um, and the, I think summer after my junior year, uh, she passed the word on to a USA gymnastics club coach who came and watched me and he was going to do a summer camp. And before you know it, I was working with him in the summer camp. And before you knew it, like this, there was just all of these crazy things happening around me at the time. Um, like there were these, uh, after school fights that happened every day after school. That was, it was just like, my brother was in those fights. He was probably leading a lot of those fights. And so it's actually kind of fun and cool to be known as the guy that could fight. I'd much rather be doing that. And all of a sudden here I am in a gymnastics unit. So it's my entire life took this gigantic turn, especially, uh, I have to point out how important that was because at the time I just, I was never a kid that knew what to do with negative emotions. So I just put them in a bottle and try to make them go away. And eventually that bottle would explode. And when it exploded, it was not very pretty. And it usually exploded in some really, really terrible ways and some things that I'm not very proud of. Um, and so all of a sudden there's this outlet for me where it's like, this is, it's not just uh, something that's fun to do, but back to the Jesse thing, it's like, man, I mean, this is, I looked at people that could do this stuff as, as gods. And here I am as, uh, as a young man teaching it uh, from the teaching the summer camps that got passed to uh, the USA Gymnastics Club that brought me in, John and Judy Redman. And they were both educators and had like, all of these degrees and things like biomechanics and physics. And so they were like mad scientists and their dream was to take the sport into the inner city kids because gymnastics is a very, it's a terribly expensive sport. Um, and long story short, the, that was their idea and their dream. So they were like, we think you have something, but we need you to unlearn everything you think you know about, about gymnastics. If you, if you don't know the science behind what you're teaching, you are not allowed to teach it. It's like, there's no science to a cartwheel. I mean, it's, I can tell you where to put your hands and your feet, but this is a cartwheel. Like, well, how much science are we talking about here? And sure enough, uh, I'll never forget, like, one of the, the first days that uh, I worked for, for them at their club, there was a kid doing a cartwheel on a balance beam. And I'm working with her, and it's getting better. It's just, I mean, she's doing the cartwheel. She's staying on the beam. And Judy Redmond grabbed me by the arm and she's like, where's her center of mass? It's like center of what? <laughs> it's a car. Wheel. She's like, where's her, where's that child's center of mass? It's like, I don't know. I told you, if you don't know the science behind what you're teaching, you're not allowed to teach it. And so before I know it, like, I'm just like really, really, really fascinated by the physics and the science of the human body and how, all the angles and pieces and, and points of, of weight, how they all coincide together to make a skill. Um, and so right out of, to answer your question, what a long way around to that, that answer. <laughs> to answer your question, right out of high school, I ended up coaching with them full time first okay. uh, before I ended up going to college. Did you go to college for uh, like exercise science or can a kinesthesiology or what did you yes that's that's it I, I wanted to go for kinesiology and biomechanics I went to Southern Illinois University I was there for a year before I got myself into a lot of trouble the the only real trouble I've ever gotten into in my entire life I've never done drugs I've never smoked a cigarette I have never touched alcohol but I have been a magnet for the craziest most troubled uh, young ladies on the planet. <laughs> uh, God almighty. Gosh, right out of high school, that almost wrecked everything that I was doing. And I recovered from that with a, a very troubled relationship. And then I go to college and it's like, all right, we're doing this. We're, 
I'm going to be one of the first in my family to get this, this college degree and got into a very crazy relationship with this young lady that just, just about ended my existence. Um, and when that came to a screeching halt, all of my pursuits at SIU came to a screeching halt. I was left <laughs> without financial aid anymore. I had no idea where I was going to go. I was basically being kicked out of college because that year was so bad. I barely attended class because I, mm-hmm. and it's, I don't know. I think I've been a sucker for, oh, do you have a lot of like terrible things happening in your life? I'll jump in and help you with those things. And before you yeah. know it, I'm fighting ex-boyfriends and ex-ex-boyfriends <laughs> and I'm getting like you know, chased down the street by crazy people. And it's like, mm-hmm. but I'm doing this in the name of love. <laughs> it, it's, it's that kind of stuff. It, you know, we could yeah. we could take a deeper dive someday, but um, <laughs> SIU came to an end, and I didn't quite know where I was going to go. Uh, and I had this buddy that followed me from high school, and he was just—he's one of those guys. He's a mover and a shaker. He's always got his hand in something that he probably uh, shouldn't uh, be doing. Uh, it's just, I don't know, kind of a, a, kind of a snake oil sort of a salesman type. And um, mm-hmm. he'd managed to find his way to a Bible college in Columbus, Ohio, and was mm-hmm. trying his hardest to get me to go there with him. And long story short with that, I ended up, I mean, I, if I stayed at SIU, I'm just going to keep fighting ex-boyfriends and I don't have any financial aid. Uh, and I turned in all these appeals to get my financial aid reinstated and they kept getting denied. I was waiting for one last shot. Uh, I had written this letter to like the chancellor or something, I was waiting to hear back. So I go with him to Ohio and it's this gigantic mega church. And they're doing this thing where they're, they've got this Bible college that's attached to the mega church and people are standing up in the service and saying, Oh, I'm going to send my son to, to this college and I'm going to pay for his tuition. And another pastor stands up and says the same. And the, the, the service is coming to an end. And uh, there's this really young couple. I think they were maybe 21 and 19 at the time. They're so young. They stepped up and said they wanted to help send their brother to this college. And the service is about to come to an end. And this couple, they, they stop them. They, they put their, they grab the, the pastor's mother by the wrist. It's like, hang on. We don't know how, but we just, there's a young man back there. And they described what I was wearing from head to toe. We want to help pay for him to go as well. I was like, come on. And I'm looking around. It's like, surely there's somebody else in a black t-shirt with a silver necklace around here. And they're just like, Yes, you, young man, will you come up here? And that day I found out that I, I wasn't going to get my financial aid reinstated to SIU. And it's like, I guess I'm going to Bible college. <laughs> I guess this is happening. This is, and what is Bible college? Like, that sounds like a weird thing. It's like, how do you teach somebody to, to preach? That seems weird. I don't know. That That's strange, but it was one of the best things that's ever happened to me. What do you Great. study at Bible? Like, what's your major? I have a I have a a degree in pastoral studies. Okay. Yeah, which is which is funny because it's like the uh, I think most people that that graduate from there they go on directly into ministry. So they're usually they're pastoring a church somewhere. But man, we got so uh, we got so burned by mega church culture and the business of church. Um, there were, I, I said, I'm going to do it differently somehow. Um, in the, um, there's this moment where, you know, by the, if I fast forward a bit, another lifetime is all of our time in that world, in the mega church world. When you name a mega church in the United States, we were probably in that church or affiliated with that church with this dance team that I was on for a while. Um, and we run it, ran into this this other guy that was just really just he's just musical savant. He's a genius, brilliant, brilliant musician. And his music with the dance team that I was on would combine and we would blow the roof off of these places. So it's just if you imagine about 25 kids who have basically all hit this wall in their life where they're just like nothing matters anymore other than 
living for something greater than myself. That was this dance team. And so we'd all just like, I mean, we were in, dancing in prisons. We were dancing in theme parks. We were dancing in inter- everywhere we could go to use dance to create conversation. And to have the like people come back up to us and say, oh, my God, like I've never seen anybody other than Usher move like that. And usually like if it's got anything to do with with God, it's like lame and it's cheesy and it's watered down but, like this. This was dope. Like this was I can relate to this. And then you start this conversation about why you you, you have a reason for your faith. Like I really wanted to use that. And it, it kind of turned into a big part of my purpose. So fast forward, the, that time at that Bible college came to a conclusion when I had a, this, this moment where I went home and I visited with my brother and he and I were sitting down at a, at a table talking and it was like the lights turned off and I saw basically almost a movie play out in my head. The lights came back on and the, without getting too, too deeply into into visions and things like that. I don't freak anybody out, but <laughs> the, the, uh, I think essentially what I felt like I came away with was that I was supposed to use for all these kids that I was mentoring in gymnastics, um, for all of the, the people I was mentoring in these inner city neighborhoods, all of the people that for whatever reason would meet me and just dump their life on me. Uh, I had this this moment where I was like, the way that I'm going to give back to them is going to be through music, film, and art. And so that's that's my why. I feel like if I don't do that, I've not achieved what it is that I'm, I've been put on this earth to do. Um, and so when I left that that Bible college, that was the next step to figure out how to do church without church, how to, to give to people and serve people and live for people, live for something greater than myself, how to actually make the world around me better, how to fight for justice, how to to stand in the face of of really, really terrible, scary things and do something about it in a way that feels personal and genuine and has no ulterior motive. That's the thing. That's the why. And I feel like I can do that through some of the the music that I like to send into the world, through the films I like to send into the world, but probably more importantly, through the one-on-one interactions that I have with people. Part two of our episode with Dwayne Logan will come out next week. We'll be talking about his short film, Black Thoughts, which he put together and put out after the shooting of Ahmaud Arbery. Um, It's an incredibly important short film. Uh, We will link it in the bio But uh, please come back for that episode next week. Thanks so much for listening. If you like the show, uh, please subscribe. Leave us a five-star review. If you aren't following us on socials, that is the Adventure Club podcast on Instagram. Uh, We're so happy you guys are here and we'll see you next week.